For those not familiar with OpenWorks, we are a facility management service provider that helps companies simplify and reduce, reduce risk in their operations. We do this by helping companies consolidate services, including janitorial, landscaping, and even supplies with technology tools to improve work oversight. Today, I'm excited to introduce Olivia LaRue from IBM Consulting, where she is the global category leader for facilities management. Olivia has over 12 years of experience in real estate, facilities, and construction, and her client portfolio includes a variety of industries representing $5 billion in spend and 200 million square feet. Welcome, Olivia. Thank you for the introduction, Andrew. It is great to be here today, and I'm excited to run through some of these concepts with our audience today. The intent of our presentation, presentation is to bring a concept of total cost of ownership in and to see how you can apply it to your facility soft service programs, particularly for janitorial programs. So at the end, at the end of the presentation, we may have some time for questions, but as Paul mentioned in the housekeeping items, if we don't get to all of them, we'll certainly take them back and send a follow-up out to you. So let's jump right in and talk about the current state of the industry. Facilities in general, we'll, we'll hone right into, into janitorial as well. If you've been on the planet for the last three or four years, you know it's been a bit of a wild ride and, the, and janitorial companies have been put through quite a bit of stress. Uh, we know back in 2020 that COVID cleaning pro protocols spiked across the world and janitorial programs had to react very, very quickly. We started to see lockdowns and work from home becoming the norm. And then in 2021, corporate office janitorial needs plummeted because of all of our lockdowns and foot traffic was almost non-existent in those corporate office and environments in those spaces. Meanwhile, in manufacturing, those folks continued to work, right? So we started to see uh, the lockdowns and work from home become the norm, but for manufacturing facilities, we were really trying to find a balance between production, social distancing, health and safety, and those sanitization protocols. So it was, 2021 was really, really difficult. Then fast forward to 2022, we all know inflation was out of control, right? And caused a lot of dramatic increases in operating expenses and the labor market was in constant turmoil because of the cost of living. It had risen so high and janitorial companies were trying to keep up and were in that reactive state again and thinking of new ways to staff their programs. So today we're now seeing a reduction in that COVID cleaning need but corporate office needs are kind of back on the table now that we're in those hybrid working environments. Folks are coming back into the office. Uh, hybrids becoming more of a normal, nor new norm, and we're starting to see that stabilization. But unfortunately, turnover and employee retention still remains top of mind. So that leads us right into some of our top challenges right now in the industry. And we talked a little bit about staffing for facilities, both hard and soft services. This is one of the most volatile spaces to be in right now. It's increasingly difficult to find and keep good talent right now. And inflation is also still a pressing issue and is still causing a lot of cost pressures on suppliers and clients alike. So finding ways of keeping costs flat requires all parties, you know, your supplier, your client, your subcontractors, everybody to start thinking creatively, thinking outside the box. So since we're all trying to reduce costs, we're also trying to become more efficient with our time and more efficient with our janitorial programs. So moving from a frequency-based program to a performance-based program has become a pretty good solution as it allows you to use your staff wisely. For example, we don't need to clean a corridor three times a day just because it says three times a day if your building is only at about you know, 30, 40% utilization or a bathroom, uh, you don't need to clean a bathroom X amount of times a day on a floor that's unoccupied, right? So it's thinking a little bit more smarter and putting in better efficiencies, moving away from that frequency base to performance and outcome. 
has been um, a really good change in the industry. And last not, but certainly not least, we're keeping up with the changing pace and trial and error of hybrid working environments, right? So while going back to the office is great for janitorial programs, it's great for business there, it is still posing a challenge to track consistent foot traffic and plan for janitorial needs accordingly. So what is to total cost of ownership? I'm sure most of you have heard of this concept, but more in the lens of facilities hard services and likely maintenance, repair, and operations. So when we think of total cost of ownership, we want to think about the whole program. And this means we account for the purchase price of a piece of equipment, we plan for any, uh, plus any installation and cost of operation. So the equation for this is relatively simple when it comes to, let's say, an HVAC program or an HVAC system. You account for the purchase price and install, you can calculate all of the PMs, your quarterly preventative maintenance, and then you can probably have a bucket in there for any estimated uh, emergency repairs throughout the, the remainder of its useful life, let's say 15, 20 years, right? So essentially we're quantifying the long-term value of the asset or the program or the service outside of just the PNL. And we can, we can apply this to labor, pretty much any labor-driven service. So let's consider what we all think about from a cost perspective. We're thinking hourly wages, right? Bottom line, it's the cost. Cost is certainly important, especially in times of higher inflation. However, hourly wages are just the tip of the iceberg. And as you can see, there are so many different factors that contribute to a successful janitorial program. And this isn't just janitorial. You can apply this to any facility soft service program, right? But in this case, a quality program in janitorial helps with employee morale. It creates a positive working environment, positive working conditions. It helps with maintaining high levels of production and can even assist in your ESG and sustainability goals, right? What types of consumables and products is your janitorial program using? Can that roll up into your, into your sustainability goals? Likely yes, right? So while hourly wages are really important, and from a procurement lens, you know, it's one of the most important factors, right? There's much, much more to the equation that our facilities managers and our procurement teams should consider when evaluating the success and the ripple effect of a janitorial program, right? So to help us visualize how we can put TCO, total cost of ownership, to work, I put together a quick example. Keep in mind, this example is very, very high level. It uses approximate numbers and figures just to drive home the point, right? But let's consider this. So we have a facilities manager making about $80,000, works in a manufacturing plant in Texas, right? His team recently went through an RFP, a request for proposal exercise, where their main focus was reducing costs, right? Oh my gosh, we're, we're hitting inflation really hard. Costs are out of control. That's our main factor. That's all we're looking at right now. Ultimately, the company chose the cheapest supplier who pays their janitorial staff about 13 bucks an hour, right? And just for sake of context, sake of simplicity, let's say that's across the entire portfolio for FTE, right? That mark is just a tad under market wage for the area. So the company at the time considered this a huge win, but ever since changing their provider, they've been really unhappy with the service levels and can't seem to keep the janitorial staff employed, right? They keep leaving, they find opportunities down the street. You know, this type of industry is really volatile and it's, a, it's really easy for folks to find new opportunities for, you know, just another dollar or dollar and a half, right? So this is leading to a pretty rough work environment for their employees and the facilities manager is having to field all sorts of complaints. 
I think we've all been in similar situations before where you choose a provider, you think it's going to be great, and then ultimately the program is unsuccessful and begins to fail. So in this scenario, we're experiencing frequent, frequent turnover with janitorial staff. It's just causing a lot of stress for the plant and the facilities manager. So when you, when you think of turnover, though, you may not consider the notice period uh, or you may only consider the notice period and the recruitment phase of the turnover process, but it's actually much lengthier than you'd expect. The first phase we call the underproduction phase. This is when you have an employee who's unhappy, begins to think about leaving the organization. They start underperforming. Their head's just not in the game, right? They're thinking, they're going to interviews, they're applying to other roles. You know, for this example, let's assume that this goes on for about three weeks and they're working about 60% efficiency. Again, they're just not in the game. They're thinking about leaving, right? That second phase is the notice period. Let's assume that our employee gives us two weeks notice. Thank you for the two weeks notice. We know that that sometimes doesn't happen. But this individual continues to work at 60% because what do they care? You know, they're leaving. So, you know, I might go clean that floor. I might not. I might not even show up, right? Our third phase is the recruitment and vacancy period. So we all know that even if we get a notice period, we likely won't be able to fill that role in time before it's vacant, right? So in this scenario, the facilities manager is working with the janitorial supplier to help fill that role and to manage the service, uh, the service quality with, with the reduced staff. So this means overtime and less efficiency, right? And last but not least, we find a good candidate, right? Great, we are begin onboarding. We know that person won't be able to come in at 100%. They're not gonna know the ins and outs of that building or that facility. They're not just gonna be able to pick up and know everything. There's a training period, there's a learning curve. So we gotta keep that in mind too. So let's say for the first week of employment, uh, this individual is working about 50%. They're training, they're, they're shadowing, they're learning the ins and outs. And then that second, second week, we're probably at 70. And then that third week, we could be almost to 100%. So as you can see, this process can take up to nine weeks. And this is nine weeks of stress, nine weeks of lower service quality, and items and problems that our facilities managers shouldn't have to and certainly don't want to deal with, right? So let's apply the concept of TCO to this scenario and get some dollars on the board here. Here are a few equations that we can put together to quantify that nine week impact of turnover, right? So for underproduction, we're accounting for that 60% efficiency of the employee. So we take that $13 an hour, we multiply 40, 40 hours a week, we calculate that 40% loss of productivity with that employment as they're thinking about leaving the organization, right? Got that 624 there. Our notice period brings in the cost of time for our facilities manager. So not only does our FM need to stop and address the fire drill and field complaints and work with the supplier to address the issue, but they're having to step away from their core responsibilities to do so. So in order to calculate this, we assume, okay, about six hours, we, six hours a week of meetings, complaints, communication with the supplier to expedite a replacement. So we have time, we have the time addressing this immediate issue, and then we have the time spent away from their core responsibilities. Similarly, with recruitment and vacancy, we see the facilities manager continuing to address the issue, interview and field candidates, but now we're seeing a bit of uptick in overtime due to the open positions. So we have other individuals coming in to fill those gaps that that other person was supposed to fill. So we're calculating that time and a half at, again, that 13 bucks an hour. And then finally, after finding a good candidate, we did it, we found somebody. We're in that onboarding phase, which remember, we still need to account for some ramp up time. 
uh, and training. So we take those efficiency rates of that 50% and 70% and we calculate. Pretty simple, right? So after all this, what does that nine week transitionary period really cost us, right? So in the math, we're about 1400 or four, yeah, $4,100, about 15% of that janitor's annual salary. Keep in mind, this is an outsourced model. If we are considering an in-house model, you could expect to see these costs double since, facility, since the facilities manager would be the sole responsible party for the replacement of that staff and would need to engage with a lot of other parties internally. Um, and for the outsource model, it's the supplier's responsibility, which helps with the risk associated with that turnover. So keep that in mind, in-house turnover costs could be much higher than this, right? Now let's say we're experiencing this type of turnover at this plant four times a year, right? People are just generally unhappy, they're leaving. Uh, that brings us up to about $16,000, $17,000 a year, and that 36 weeks of stress. Remember that nine-week time frame, multiply it by four. Let's take it a, a step further here. Let's assume that this provider is the janitorial provider for 30 plants at the company, right? Let's say they take they have North America as their portfolio. And let's say we're seeing the similar issues across the board where the supplier is paying under market and seeing a ton of turnover, right? And I know for the sake of, for this, again, for the sake of simplicity, we're gonna keep that 13 bucks across the board. We know that California may be higher, New York may be higher. There could be lower rates of elsewhere, less, um, less, you know, less in market wages. But we could take that $16,000 and multiply it by 30 this could be about half a million dollars worth of cost due to unproduction or underproduction and lost time. Y'all know time is money, right? And this is a way you can apply it. So what could we have done differently here? Had we selected a provider that paid market wages and implemented better KPIs for quality and employee retention, we may have been able to reduce this turnover by let's say about half. Now we understand folks come and go all the time. So there's no way to completely eliminate turnover, but we can certainly reduce it by a substantial amount with a successful program. Just keeping people happy on a day-to-day -day basis will make them stay, right? And we all know if you're in kind of a tough or toxic work environment, or if you're just underpaid, you're going to start thinking, oh gosh, is it really worth being here? Do I need to go somewhere else? And then in this environment too, particularly in janitorial spaces, we find that the folks that are working in your spaces, they could be related. They could be a family. They could, it could be a father or a son. Um, so if one person leaves, we all know that trend could happen more frequently. You know, if, if one person finds an opportunity, the next one will, and it can just be a cycle, right? So keeping folks really happy can keep the success and consistency of your program, right? So now we have gone through an example that you can take home with you and start thinking about your janitorial programs in a different way. I wanna make sure you have some really solid takeaways here. So number one, think holistically. Think about your entire program and know what the ripple effects are. Number two, your program isn't just about dollars and cents. And while it's easy to fall into that trap, remember that iceberg image, right? Remember that iceberg in your mind and think about all of the other costs outside of just dollars that can impact your business. And number three, build strong supplier relations. If you build a program with your supplier and build a mutual beneficial program with beneficial metrics for success, the likelihood of a quality program will be much higher. The need for micromanagement will be much less. 
and leveraging your suppliers who know the ins and outs of their business so you can focus on your core responsibilities that will allow you to breathe and it'll allow you to create a better environment for your employees and allow you to focus on the task at hand. You can focus more on your production line. You can focus more on your preventative maintenance because what we really want at the end of the day as facilities managers, you want suppliers in your corner that have your back and that you can set it and forget it, right? You may have your QBRs, you may have your touch points. You, you do wanna have a good governance model in place to ensure the success of the program. But you really do want a supplier that, hey, they got it. I don't need to drop everything and take care of this. My, my account manager, he's got it. I don't need to worry about it. So just think about some of those factors as you're considering your facility soft service programs, because there truly is a deep benefit that's outside of just your P&L and outside of just the bottom dollar, right? So with that said, you know, I want to really thank each and every one of you for attending today's session. I would love to connect and help answer any questions that you may have about TCO or just facility services in general. Here's my contact info. You can email call or find me on LinkedIn. And I've, I've had a great time presenting with you folks. And I know that we're going to be sending this out later. And with, with that, I want to turn it back over to Andrew. So I think we do have some time for questions. Thanks, Olivia. Again, if you have a question, please enter it in the questions panel. Uh, we'll probably not get to all the questions today, but then we'll be, as Olivia mentioned, we'll follow up uh, by email with some answers to those uh, within the week. While we wait for questions, um, IBM Consulting, Olivia is a part of Olivia, uh, part of IBM Con Consulting, and they can help you and your organization uh, improve your procurement processes from tactical buying to strategic sourcing to uh, analytics and uh, supplier management. They can uh, also help you develop category strategies and leverage their industry expertise to bring in uh, best procurement practices that drive savings and create efficiencies for your facility programs. So I'll add here that um, Olivia works with many companies like yourself. So she has a wealth of knowledge about what's working, what's not working, and also best practices that, that can help you out. So feel free to uh, contact Olivia directly for more information. Also, if you would like more information about OpenWorks facility services, you can uh, visit openworksweb.com. We help uh, companies like yourself bundle services, including janitorial, across multiple locations uh, to reduce overall costs and improve operational oversight. So with that, we'll go ahead and start with the uh, first question, and that is, what are some effective trends that have been implemented to reduce employee turnover? Yeah, so some of the biggest trends, and I've seen this a lot, is coming to a mutual agreed upon wage rate that fits the market and you can actually tie retention KPIs to it. So let's say, you know, you, you, you are uh, negotiating with your supplier and you're, you're putting KPIs in place. You can say, hey, let's do like a risk reward KPI here. Let's say, you know, if you can keep your turnover rate at, you know, above uh, or below 40, 40%, you get a reward, right? You can have a percentage of your management fee. If you come below that, you can have a risk, right? So you find that percentage point that helps with having a solid rate, keeping that turnover rate um, at a reasonable level. You know, I do, do recognize, like I said, you're never going to completely eliminate it, but adding some KPIs that you can tie directly to the wages that you mutually agree on and have that risk reward is a really great way of doing it. Also, we look at, from the procurement lens, we look at the career paths that companies can offer their folks. We find that if if companies are offering trainings or offering um, career roadmaps and ladders for their for their folks and having paths, uh, it helps with retainage, right? Um, so we do look at that. You know, if you have a solid program and if you have case studies that say, hey, we have this, we had a day porter and now he or she is an account lead, right? We love to see that story 
because it speaks volumes to the um, the loyalty that your your folks may have to the program. So we think about KPIs, tying them to a risk reward. You can tie in their turnover rate. You can you can speak with your supplier about what an appropriate rate would be. And then we look at the training programs and the continued education that your suppliers offer. And we find that those are some really, really good things to add. Great. So we have another question here. It's uh, which hidden facility costs have trended to be the most influential in purchasing decisions? Yes. So we've got a couple clients and I'll tell you one of the biggest headaches that I hear is the time suck from facilities managers having to micromanage, right? If there is a facilities manager that's spending hours on micromanaging a supplier, that is the quickest indicator of we need to go, we need to go to bid, we need to find another supplier, bring them in. Um, I'm spending way too much time on this. You know, we may need to look at the structure of the program. Do we have proper leadership for the supplier? Do we need to kind of change some things, swap some, some people out? Do we have conflicts in personality? But I would say the, the time in micromanaging a program is a really big factor, um, especially when facilities is struggling as a whole in finding good experienced talent. So we recognize that a lot of times we're working in a skeleton crew. You know, if you have a production line and you are, let's say you have a, a few folks that are retiring who really know the business, you're trying to backfill those folks. The last thing you need is a janitorial program that's failing, right? So if it's failing and it's causing disruption, that's the biggest indicator that it's time to make a change. And of course, cost, right? It's always good to test the market to see, you know, what's going on in the market. Am I getting the best value? You know, we do like to test every, you know, two, three years or so to say, is this the right program? Can we reevaluate some things? Can we tweak some things in the efficiencies? But yeah, I, every, we see this all the time in, you know, my facilities, OPEX stakeholders is, hey, I'm spending way too much time on managing this supplier. I shouldn't be doing this. And they're absolutely right. So getting the right players in place and making sure that the program is, is essentially running like a well-oiled machine is, is our goal. And the savings come after that, right? Savings will happen. But if you don't have a good program in place, you're going to be spending more time and money than it's worth. Okay, I think we have time for just one more. And this one has to do with sanitation. Um, I know sanitation was, was extremely important, obviously, during the pandemic. And this person's asking if there's a best practice to either have your own sanitation staff or farming it out to a contract service. Yeah, and that's a great question. And it really depends on the type of risk that your company is willing to take on, right? So we understand that things behind the yellow line, you know, on the production area and the sanitation area, clean rooms, right? There's a particular skill set. There's a particular set of uh, instructions and things that you need to abide by, right? It really boils down to the appetite for risk and ensuring that the contracts and the suppliers are pre-qualified to the nth degree, right? Anytime you have a supplier that's behind the yellow line, you want to make sure that they're completely vetted. You're asking the right qualifications questionnaires. You're viewing their, you're seeing case studies. You're getting references from other clients. We go really in depth because we know if there's an issue behind the yellow line that causes a plant shutdown, that's going to wipe out any savings that you might see, right? So it boils down to the risk, right? If you want to keep it in-house, that's okay. But there could be an element to where, well, if you are sanitizing in-house, could you put those folks on the production line instead and increase your production? Or do you bring somebody else in that can enable you to bring in more production, right? There's a, there's a lot of factors there. And you know, I'm happy to go in depth into that as well. So you know, reach out to me. I, I would love to talk to you about some of the pros and cons. Um, and we've seen it both ways, right? It just depends on the appetite for risk. 
Great. Thanks, Olivia. So it looks like we're out of time. I know there were some more questions here. So if we did, did not get to your question, we'll follow up with a response. Um, we'll work with Olivia on getting those out uh, within the week uh, by email. Um, we'll also be emailing out a recorded version of this webinar. So then you could share this. You could watch it again, or you could share it with some of your coworkers. So at this point, um, this concludes the event. I want to thank everybody for attending.